Once again, for those of you who are familiar and those of you who are visiting with us today, uh, we are uh, now on our fourth part of our series through the book of Exodus entitled The God of Promise, uh, getting at this big idea that it is not by our faithfulness to God, but God's faithfulness uh, to himself and the promise that he has made that we have any hope at all in uh, being found favorable in his eyes. Uh, so, as we now turn to our scripture reading for this morning, Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, let us all rise in reverence and respect for God's word. Once again, our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. People of God, let us now give ear for this is a reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you kill the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water, uh, excuse me, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may uh, eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And thus the reading of God's word. You may be seated. We will pray, and we'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we give you praise and we give you thanks uh, for your goodness. You have allowed us to come thus far in a new series that you have allowed us to start uh, through the book of Exodus. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes even now, as early as we are in this series, to your faithfulness, to the promise of that you have made to save a people for yourself. And Lord, in the establishing, even in the infant stages of you establishing Israel as your people, Lord God, therein we would see a greater rescue, the hope of a greater rescue that is to come. For a people for yourself, from their bondage, our bondage, to sin and to death. That we would see the light of Christ, the hope of life in him that is to come, shine through the pages of scripture as we read this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is truly not in spite of what we have done or who we are, but precisely despite everything that we are and 
quite frankly, nothing we have done. Lord, it is you that has always been on the move for us to save us to yourself. Thank you for finding favor in unworthy, undeserving sinners like us, that we should be found, that we should be found in you. We thank you. Be with us in this time as we read your word. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, before we open our time, I just want to thank our praise team. Uh, you would hardly think that our praise team has been only working together for just a couple months uh, the way they have led us in praise this morning. I just want to praise the Lord for their service and, and just thank them uh, for their dedication. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you guys a question this morning, and I wouldn't be surprised if all of us came up with the same answer. If you were to give a description, if you were to paint an image of a person who would lead, what would that image look like? What kind of description would you give? Now, I think a lot of us, we would, when we think of a leader, or at least a capable leader, a, a worthy leader, especially if they're going to be somebody that is going to take on this huge task of leading hundreds of thousands of people out of the most powerful country, the most powerful nation in its day anyways, to lead these people into freedom and liberty. What would you say that leader would look like? I think a lot of us would think a leader should be well-groomed, well put together, has everything organized, somebody that we can all look up to and follow after as an example, someone that is charismatic perhaps even, See, the way we show favor to somebody as one worthy of our, uh, not only our uh, obedience, but also our allegiance, we think in terms of a lot of the way this world really operates and thinks, and that is that person must first prove himself to be worthy of my following and thereafter, if he proves himself worthy enough, capable enough, well put together enough, then I will find him suitable as a leader. I will show him favor and I will follow him. A lot of times, do we not operate that way when we guard ourselves with the way God should view us? very conditional, very calculated. God should only show favor to those who are favorable and love those who are lovable. And therefore, don't we spend so much of our days and so much of our times proving and living to show myself, to prove to myself, to show others, to prove to others that we are worthy of being found favorable in God's eyes. That somehow God's love and favor on you is preconditioned on how you operate, how you behave, and how you act. And God's choosing Moses or God choosing you is somehow calculated on how well you perform and how well you show God that you are worthy of his favor.
You see, that is, that is how we think. That is how we operate. We love those who are lovable. We care for those who are worthy of our care. We extend ourselves to those who we find favorable. But beloved, this morning as we approach the pages of Scripture, I want you to see... I want you to see the initial state of Moses in which he is called, in which he is preserved, and he prepared to lead Israel. I don't think if we saw Moses without any of the context that is to follow that we already know about, I don't think we would think of Moses as a capable leader. Because the very first picture of Moses we get is one that is presumptuous and that of a murderer. I understand that Moses' heart went out to his fellow Israelite because the word that is used to describe how Moses saw his fellow Israelite Yara, I believe, is the word. It's not just a, a, a simple observation, but it is, it is a seeing that requires emotion. It is, a, it is an observation that requires of a person. Affection and connection to that which he is seeing. I understand that his heart went out to his fellow Israelite who was being abused and therefore taking justice into his own hand. To rescue this Israelite. Would kill the Egyptian slave driver. But, and then people have said and try to justify his works by saying, perhaps this is a, a picture of Moses saving Israel from, from the Egyptians long before Moses is called to save Israel from the Egyptians. However, we have to remember that this was not God's will of how Moses would do that. Moses didn't stop to think, to consider what God would have him do before he went ahead and did it. And though you might say his intentions might have been noble, beloved, it was, it was, it was not a heart. It was not done out of a heart that I gave careful thought To what God would have had him do. To perhaps wait. And to be patient. Until he would fully realize. His. His place as a leader. Over Egypt or Israel. Excuse me. And second. Moses was guilty of murder. Beloved, I tell you all the shortcomings of Moses not to highlight the shortcomings of Moses, but I want to highlight for you the immensity and the depth of God's love and his favor for those that are broken. That God does not care for those who are well put together. And God does not care for those who have their acts straight. But that God 
and his heart goes out to those that are broken and those that are messy and those who are sinners. Precisely because broken, messy, sinful people is all that there are. In God's calling of Moses, we don't see the depth of Moses' brokenness, but we see the boundless depths of God's favor and his love to save and to rescue people that don't deserve to be saved and to be rescued. The inexhaustible nature and character of God's love and mercy. His choosing, electing of Moses demonstrates that even where sin might prevail, hear this, where sin would prevail, God's heart extends far deeper, reaches far deeper than your deepest sins. And your darkest sins. It is into the deadness of our hearts that God shines the light of his grace. That we would know that as uncertain of a leader Moses might look to be, let alone an uncertain person deserving of God's grace Moses might seem to be, how undeserving unwarranted we ourselves are of God's grace. As uncertain of a people, we are beloved. Here, God demonstrates the absolute certainty of his heart to rescue and to redeem you, to save you, to draw you to himself. We as Christians operate completely differently. We don't operate based on calculation, based on condition. But we, we deal with one another and relate with one another just the way God has dealt with you in Christ. Without condition. In grace. Freely, abundantly showing, dispensing, and giving to you everything that you never deserved. And withholding everything from you that we in our flesh and in our soul scream that we deserve. I hope that we would see in the brokenness of Moses, who God found worthy to lead Israel, and even brokenness of our own self. And just as God, who showed so much kindness and mercy to choose and save Moses, that we would, in complete abandon of ourselves, cling to the promises of God, that his heart is for you. I, 
is, it, is the, it is that breath of fresh air. As we, as we live in this world, just suffocated by, by performing or outperforming or upkeeping our performance to show people that we're worthy of their affection and love. Is it in a breath of fresh air that in our relationship with God, He doesn't call us to perform and outperform and upkeep ourselves. But despite on every, anything that we can ever do, and even before we can ever do anything worthy, that God should come, that He should initiate the communion between us and Him. That breath of fresh air is true breath for our lungs, for our hearts, to breathe in us a new life. And as we continue to see in the unfolding of our scripture reading this morning, that we would no longer see ourselves as citizens of this world. But beloved, that we would cherish and we would envy and that we would long for the life of a sojourner. In this uncertain leader, we see the certainty of God's love. But even more so, we, we see here an uncertain rescue. When Ruel's daughters come to their father saying that it is an Egyptian that has saved them. There we see a paradigm of a greater rescue that is to come through Moses. Moses, prior to his calling, was through and through an Egyptian. To be identified as an Egyptian, that is because appearance-wise, character-wise, everything about Moses screamed that he was the prince of Egypt, the son of Pharaoh not a leader of God's people. And yet, here is this man who has just rescued and performed rescue an unlikely person, so it seemed to be. Before it, Moses is called, he is identified as an Egyptian. And so too, beloved, before you are called, you will be identified as one who belongs to this world. Everything about you would scream and testify that you are a son of the world and not a son of God or daughter of God. That is our original, our natural estate until God calls you to himself.
But as we continue on here, I, I want us to pay attention that, that Moses was once identified as an Egyptian. Verse 22, after marrying his wife Zipporah, they have a son and Moses names him Gershom, which means sojourner. In this naming of his son, beloved, there is, there is there's symbolism here. It is symbolic of Moses cutting ties with Egypt. A man who was identified with Egypt. So much so, he didn't even have to say he was from Egypt and people would know that he was an Egyptian. Once he is called by God, once he, he has been called out of Egypt, and during this, his time in Midian, being prepared to be that leader who God will call him to be. Beloved, he cuts, he cuts ties with Egypt, no longer identified with the world that he once knew as his heart began to be inclined toward a greater life a greater abode than not even all the riches of Egypt could afford for him. I want us to give thought to this verse for a minute. Because I think a lot of us lives with this identity crisis. We have, we have one foot in the world and we have another foot in the church, and, but we don't know where we belong. We're not a sojourner here. We're not a sojourner there. We're not a citizen here. We're not a citizen there. We're just very, very confused I think we're very back and forth because deep in our hearts remains this, this conviction that this world still has something to offer us what God and what God cannot. that there's still something meaningful, purposeful, worthy that, that has yet to be grasped in this world. That we are convinced that everything that we already need, that we already possess in God through Christ, that we're not convinced by that yet, fully yet, that there's still some, some hints of joy and significance that is left to be had in this world. Beloved, that we're, we're still very much caught up in building for ourselves the title of being the prince of this world rather than sons of God. I hope that we would see afresh this morning 
the attractiveness of the good news of salvation in Christ. To really understand, know that everything, beloved, hear me, everything that you can ever hope for, you already possess and is yours in Christ. And that we would have a new category, new idea of what it is that we really hope for. What is it that we really want? And if it is true that the reasons why we strive for such significance and such importance in this world is so that we can establish for ourselves life, to have life, the meaning of life, Beloved, that true life, enduring life, lasting life that will far exceed the greatest life you could ever have in this one is already yours in Christ. That we would have our eyes open to see how unattractive this world is. And beloved, that we too would desire a life of a sojourner. Not only from Egypt, but a sojourner in this world, that this world is not where we belong. This world is not where our home is. But that our home and our abode, our eternal abode is with him and in him who is not just a prince, but the prince of peace, the son of God our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we begin to see more and more clearly the unfolding of God's promise to rescue a people for himself, in him preserving Moses and raising him up to be this leader, and through him establishing this people through which he would raise up a savior. I pray that God's heart for you, his love for you, would woo us and draw us to cherish and delight in the life that he has won for us <clears throat> and to live as citizens of his kingdom, bearing the characters of that kingdom. looking more and more like the king of that kingdom than whatever kingdoms this world could offer for us and we could ever establish for ourselves. There's only one prince, beloved, that is worthy of your allegiance and that has proved himself to be worthy of your favor. And that is not Moses, but it is him who was blameless, who owed 
us nothing. And yet, at every cost to himself, humbling himself, this prince came to live the life you and I could not live. Died the death you and I deserve to die. That in his life, we would find every reason to put to death this life and take up the mantle, the cross, the life of a sojourner. And in his death, beloved, there we find every hope and every reason for living. There is no sin too grave, no sin so dark, no sin so deep that the love of God cannot reach and cleanse and redeem you from. As we enter these infant stages of God unfolding his unilateral promise of salvation to man. Beloved, I pray that only one thing and one thing would remain clear. And that is this. While you and I we will, we will prove ourselves unfaithful. Beloved, we stand here today. We stand in hope of that life that is to come today because God is faithful to you. Let that sink deep into our hearts that God is that much for you, that he is for you, that he is for your rescue and to have you. And that he did not come to people that have open hands ready to receive, but while we were so inward on ourselves, so caught up in ourselves, so fist, with our fists so tight around the treasures that we could obtain in this world, that God would come and to these ungrateful hands that he would open that up and that he would place in our hands that invitation to receive life in him. Beloved, that is our God. His faithfulness is the reason for our hope and therefore, beloved, may his faithfulness be indicative. Now, For us, to truly be attracted to, to living our lives for that kingdom, His kingdom, which he had every cost to himself, makes open and possible to us. In every reason for uncertainty, every glimpse of an unlikelihood and everything about Moses that calls to us he is so undeserving may that be a mirror for us to see ourselves that in our sin we are uncertain unlikely and undeserving and yet God
saw it favorable to love you, to save you, and to unite you to his son, that you would no longer be identified as a prince or a princess of the world, but as his son and as his daughter. As we see God's faithfulness, and as we will come to see a greater picture of it, beloved, may we be drawn outside of ourselves that we would find ourselves daily, regularly in, in Christ, hoping, delighting in, and cherishing not the life you can have for yourself here, but the life that God has won for you. And he's making sure that he will win for you in him choosing this very unlikely leader. Pray that just as Moses, his response to God's calling was an equivocal yes and amen, that this morning as God invites you to see that life that he offers you, that we will respond in the same way. Yes.